Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this month's talk in this series, An Inquiry into Racism and Health Inequities, brought to you by the group UCSF Healthcare Advocates for Social Justice. My name is Karishma Raghuwanchi, and I'm an Administrative Director in Radiation Oncology and a member of the UCSF Healthcare Advocates for Social Justice. I also have the pleasure of introducing today's esteemed speaker. Before introductions, I want to provide a little background on this lecture series. The UCSF Healthcare Advocates for Social Justice formed in response to rampant anti-Black racism in the United States, and it represents a diverse group of staff. As part of our work, we created this lecture series to promote critical thinking and reflection. Throughout the series, attendees will hear from community activists that live in the work of anti-racism on a broad range of topics. The hope is that you hear something that inspires a deeper pause, which in turn could fuel action and change in UCSF's anti-racism efforts. To pair our time here with real efforts on the ground, we decided to match each talk with an invitation to donate or get involved with the community's organization. This is completely optional. Today's organization is a World Food Program, a humanitarian organization whose mission is saving lives and changing lives delivering food assistance in emergencies, and working with communities to improve nutri nutrition and build resilience. There will be five to 10 minutes at the end of the lecture for audience questions and comments. Since this is a webinar, please use the chat and Q&A functions. Now, I am honored to introduce writer, activist, mother, and Diversability Partnerships Manager, Nidhi Jaisur. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am going to be sharing my screen, so I will just um, do that now. Okay. But yeah, I want to say thank you. I want to start off by saying thank you. Thank you all for the work that you do. And thank you so much for creating the space. I'm really excited to share my story with you all, and I hope it would be helpful. 
Now, before I start, a few um, a few quick accessibility notes for anyone with vision impairments or anyone who's just using the audio part of this webinar, a quick visual description. My name is Nidhi Chaser. Um, I'm a South Asian woman with whitish colored skin and black shoulder length hair, wearing round glasses, a black and white jacket and maroon top, um, seated in a high back office chair. Uh, the slides I'll be presenting today are just summaries of what I'll be speaking about. So, um, and if you're using a transcript, I have a South Asian accent, um, which might affect the transcribing. Um, and I'm also happy to um, pass on a clean transcript, um, if that would be helpful. And uh, I also want to let you know that I had a concussion in February, so I might need a minute here and there um, during this. So um, I want to start off by... Um, just making sure it's playing. Okay, I, I want to start off by inviting you to explore the concept of identity. Um, now, there are two types of identity. There's social identity and there's personal identity. Race, gender, sexual orientation, age, these are some examples of social identities, which are groupings based on certain characteristics of individuals. Personal identity is what differentiates us from others within a social identity group. Um, now, here are my social identities. Now, I want to tell you about a doctor's visit that I had way back in 2014 that I remember as clear as it was yesterday. I came in with chronic neck pain that I had been struggling with for the past four years after an accident and which had become quite disabling, not only because of the symptoms, but also because of my response to the pain and the cumulative amount of time that I'd been experiencing it for. The pain had so far been ascribed to um, myofascial pain and fibromyalgia. I'd also been diagnosed with depression and anxiety, and I would soon be diagnosed with traumatic, uh, sorry, post-traumatic stress disorder because of the trauma of the pain. And I was working in IT at the time, although remotely. Now my doctor heard my detailed story, but one of the first things he said to me after I completed was, and I paraphrase, oh, I see so many Indians with your condition, a lot hypermobile joints, chronic pain, and working in IT. And then he joked that he practiced in Fremont and maybe that was why. And I have to admit it, that was a little funny. But he led the conversation with this. Um, and now, as I mentioned, I had a complex and traumatic relationship with my pain. So for him to put me in a box based on two identifiers felt slightly dismissive because in my mind, I was now being judged as just a South Asian working in IT and a woman. And I wondered if other key aspects of my experience were being ignored. Now, all of us tend to stereotype based on identities. I do it as well. Of course, this has benefits in research. I was indeed more likely to have hypermobility as a South Asian. I also think social identities are important because they give us some amount of context when we first meet a person. But there are some issues that I have with social identities, especially when we stereotype based on them. One issue is that our lived experience, our life story is so much more than just our social and even our personal identities, because we can't capture our essence with just a series of words. The second issue is that we may not resonate as much with one identity, um, even though it's ascribed to us. And thirdly, and most importantly, when we stereotype based on, on an identity, we, we apply certain characteristics to people with that identity, regardless of whether it applies to them or not. And this can sometimes lead to bias, sometimes unconscious, sometimes explicit. And all of us, me included, have some degree of bias ingrained in us, which in turn, turn forms uh, systems of power, privilege, and oppression between different social identity groups. And I think stereotypes should be questioned and validated or challenged rather than assumed. And that's how we break free of bias. Now, I'd be remiss not to talk about the concept of intersectionality. Our social identities can intersect and overlap. The term intersectionality is used to describe this, and it was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, a legal scholar, to describe the ways that individuals experience various facets of privilege or oppression as a result of their intersecting social identities. And similar to the theory of intersectionality, I like to think of us as intersecting circles where we maybe resonate with one identity a little more closely than another, even though both are ascribed to us. And at the center of that intersection is our lived experience, our personalities, our essence, essentially our story. 
For now, let me back up a bit and tell you my story. Let me introduce myself with more of my intersecting circles. And as I tell you my story, I'd love for you to decide what parts of it would be helpful in the clinical setting. Because for now, all that you know about me is my social identities, the fact that I have chronic pain after an accident, I have some mental health conditions, and um, I also have type 3 Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, also um, known as hypermobility. My backstory is that I spent my childhood in Nigeria and India, and my parents came from two very different cultures and religions in India. So I had a sense of being an immigrant even before I actually became one. My dad was in the Indian Navy and retired early because of his chronic back pain. My mom was a homemaker. My dad was a very strict parent growing up, but I also had a very sheltered upbringing. I was an introvert and I loved to read. I was bullied in middle school. I almost studied medicine. I got accepted into medical school in India and I read Atul Gawande's book, Complications. And then I decided I wouldn't be a good doctor and I would be really anxious about making a mistake. And so I studied electronics engineering, which I absolutely hated. And I had my first panic attack in college, but there was no way to transfer majors like you could here in the US. And so I studied hard and graduated. I came to the US to a small you know, city town called College Station in 2007 for a degree in information systems. I graduated in December of 2008 and got a job in Houston. I first lived with a roommate and then decided to live independently by myself. So for me in 2010, I was living the quote unquote American dream. I was a financially independent young woman who had just started her career. My family was back in India and I was in a long distance relationship with my then boyfriend, now husband, who was here in Silicon Valley. So my support system was primarily calls and text messages. And this was 2010. So, you know, a really grainy Skype call was the best you could do for a video call. Now, um, a content warning, the next few minutes will have a description of an accident. And I want to tell you about this accident and a series of healthcare visits where a lot of my identities and my experiences came into play. And my attempt here is to dissect what happened and how my identities, experience, and situations shaped these interactions. So one Friday evening in January of 2010, I was driving home from work, but I was taking an alternate route because I needed to stop by the temple because my parents told me to do so. Now the stereotype of a good South Asian daughter is that you obey your parents and that stereotype was true for me. I was driving down a feeder road which was entering the highway and I tried to change lanes, but I couldn't see that the curb had already started and I made that lane change too late. So my car basically rammed into the curb from underneath and bounced off while I braked. It was quite jarring, uh, but there was no broken glass. There was no deployed airbag. And when I called 911, I simply asked for a tow truck because I couldn't start my engine and I was worried I would get hit by a car. I remember the 911 operator asking me if I was hurt and if I needed an ambulance and I said I was okay. Now I described this to drive home an important point. I didn't think the accident was a big deal. And it was only a few weeks later when I got my car's repair invoice that I learned that my car's axle had broken and the entire undercarriage had to be replaced. So maybe it was a big deal. I just didn't know it at the time. So when I felt my first pang of pain an hour later, I got worried, but I brushed it off, telling myself I would be okay in a day or two. Now, a day of intense pain later, I went to the urgent care on a Saturday to get myself evaluated. I remember an x-ray being taken and I remember being told that pain management, pain management was vital and to take it easy for the next few days. Now, here's an important backstory. I had never gotten a significant injury in my life. The most I had was as a teenager when I had a hairline fracture on my tailbone after jumping off a trampoline. And I had to sit on a donut cushion, which was really embarrassing, especially if you were in middle school. But in that case, the remedy had been simple and clear. Sit on a cushion and you'll be fine in a few weeks. Now, the year before this accident in 2009, I had suffered an upper back sprain while carrying a heavy box that I thought I would be able to handle. But it wasn't as severe as the pain I was experiencing now after the accident. Now, a brief side note, by the way, at the time of that sprain the year before in 2009, the doctor I saw had given me a prescription for physical therapy at his clinic, but I didn't have a car at the time. I had taken a taxi to his clinic and in those days it was expensive and there was no Uber and the public transport system in my area of Houston wasn't that great. 
I had asked him if he could uh, refer me someplace closer, but he said he couldn't. In hindsight, I wish I had pressed pressed him for you know giving me that prescription, or if I I wish I had made a, found a way to make public transit work, because ultimately I just treated the sprain with muscle relaxants and Bengay, and the symptoms went away eventually. I hadn't realized the importance of physical therapy. So when the PA at the urgent care told me to take it easy for a few days, I didn't quite understand what that meant for the level of pain that I was experiencing. Do you mean bed rest? I asked. Definitely not, the PA said. I'm paraphrasing, but I remember him saying something to the effect of, just don't go crazy at the gym, maybe take a break for a few days, don't go running. Now, I realize in retrospect that another context missing in the conversation was the fact that I didn't really exercise. Growing up for the most part in India, sports wasn't as big as it was here in the US, and it definitely wasn't big in my family. So I didn't run, the gym was not part of my life, and I had skipped my previously prescribed physical therapy. So I was in really poor muscle health. More importantly though, if I had been more proactive in my care rather than passive, I might have offered this relevant piece of information or asked clarifying questions. This passiveness was probably tied to my experience of growing up in India. In India, generally speaking, again, I'm generalizing here, I am kind of stereotyping, the doctor was a director rather than a partner in your healthcare. The doctor was responsible for your health and he and she gave you orders and you didn't question it, you just took it or you didn't. I've now realized that I'm responsible for my health and my doctor is a partner in my healthcare. And understanding this difference in doctor-patient dynamics has been key to my current experience as a patient in the healthcare system. Now, I did ask an important question at the end of that urgent care appointment. The PA told me he would be he would give me a prescription of Vicodin, and he stepped out to get the printout, and I thought he'd be back. I wanted to ask him if I would benefit from taking a few days off work. But his assistant came back instead and gave me the prescription. And when I asked to speak to the PA for a quick minute, I was told that it wouldn't be possible and the clinic was closing up soon. The only other option was to call back later because they didn't have like a my chart type system. I remember that I didn't speak up or protest, probably because I was a fresh immigrant who didn't want to question the system or question an authority figure. I'd also felt silly that I hadn't thought of that question earlier in the appointment. Now, the urgent care told me to follow up with my PCP, but not knowing the medical system well, I instead went directly to an orthopedic surgeon. Now, this is what I would have done in India, where there wasn't this concept of referrals. And I had a PPO insurance, so it was permissible. But in hindsight, I wish I'd gone to my PCP instead, where they had some of my medical records and they would have directed me better. So around five days after the accident, I went straight to the office of an orthopedic surgeon. Now, in those five days, the pain had continued to increase and I was worried. I was confused because I was in more pain than I had expected because I thought the accident wasn't a big deal. I was also dealing with immense guilt because I had caused this accident. I had made a mistake. And in my upbringing, mistakes meant more than just failure. It meant castigation and shame. My parents were also halfway across the world and my mother wasn't in good health. I didn't want her to worry and I took on that burden of easing her worry. I told my parents I was okay. I was also scared by the amount of pain and dysfunction I was in and I was living alone. I remember struggling to cook, struggling to take a shower, even struggling to pull up a pair of pants. I just ate toast and fruit for days and I couldn't wash my hair till my boyfriend came to visit me and help me out. And in those days, there was no grocery delivery service, so I relied on the goodwill of friends to drop off a meal or some groceries. I was just so traumatized of being alone that my first response, my, my response really was just to pretend that everything was fine and that I was okay. Now, I finally confided in my dad about the amount of pain I was in, and he told me what he usually told himself. The pain will be there, you just have to ignore it. The mind controls the body. Now, that was usually what he told himself, and I also think he was in denial because he was scared as well, and he just wanted me to tell him I was okay because he was, again, halfway across the world, and there was no way he could travel to be with me. And this was a double whammy because not only was I pretending I was okay, but the person that I confided in also told me to do the same. So because of all of this, when I met the, when I met the orthopedic doctor, let's call him Dr. A, I ended up downplaying my symptoms. Dr. A came in with a troop of assistants for a very brisk visit. I don't think I told him the story that I just told you about how the soreness was affecting my functioning. Dr. A did another x-ray and also ordered some MRIs, which came back clean a few days later. 
He told me I had whiplash and it was just a soft tissue injury. Now, this time, when I asked him if I need a time off work, he told his assistant to write me a note. So now I had received a note to take time off work, but because of my guilt, I felt like I'd gotten one only because I asked. And besides, he hadn't really answered my question of if I needed time off work and if it would help me. So while this doctor was making sure that he was taking care of me, whatever he said was being filtered through my context of guilt, of a trauma response, of pretending I was fine, of not being in touch with my own body and thinking that pain was something to be tolerated. And these contexts may have also contributed to an unfortunate turn of events outside the clinic. Because even as I handed my note to my manager, I continued to help out with work requests remotely from home because the project was in a delicate final stage and I had a sense of obligation. And this was something that I later learned was a trauma response for me. I felt obliged to take care of everyone else around me, even to the detriment of my own health. I was feeling extremely guilty. I remember a colleague, jo a colleague joked about how I could enjoy my break and watch lots of TV, which caused me to feel super guilty and do exactly the opposite. And because I never sent that note to HR, my manager very subtly kind of coerced me into working for a few hours a day, which slowly became full days. I was here on a visa, I was naive, and I had absolutely no sense of boundaries. That's a whole other story that's outside the scope of today's topic, of course, but I want to mention what was going on in parallel outside the healthcare system, because I feel like one system impacts the other. So for the five weeks that I was in the care of Dr. A, the orthopedic doctor, I continued to work and push myself through the pain. I told him I was working part-time from home and he suggested I wear a neck collar to help. He probably thought I was feeling better and wanted to work. I don't think he knew about my guilt, the fact that I was scared and that I was pushing through the pain because each visit was only a few minutes long and he always had one or two assistants with him and I felt shy to speak up. I also didn't have good pain management after the accident because of a few things. One was of course me ignoring my pain, pretending I was okay, trying to be brave like my dad. Another reason was my guilt. I was punishing myself in some strange way. Another reason was because the Vicodin that the urgent care prescribed made me very dizzy and I was afraid I would fall in my apartment while living alone, so I used it sparingly. A colleague also told me about Vicodin addiction and I was hesitant to take it. I ultimately decided to hold off on any pain management till I saw Dr. A who prescribed diclofenac. It made me very nauseous and gave me horrible heartburn. But when I asked if there was another anti-inflammatory he could prescribe, he got a little defensive and refused, saying that I could take Advil over the counter. And I wonder if I hadn't communicated my issue well enough or if I'd come across as blaming his choice of medication. My stomach had been messed up enough from the diclofenac, so I think I just stopped taking anything altogether, which was a poor decision on my part. Now, the last visit that I had with Dr. A was five weeks after the accident. My manager called me on a Thursday and said, it's been five weeks of you being at home and taking it easy. Shouldn't you be moving on? Now, I was taken aback by this because I hadn't been taking it easy. I had been working through the pain, pushing through the pain. At this point, I wanted to email HR and complain, except that all communication had been either in on the phone or in person. So it was a tricky situation. I didn't see any other option other than going back to work because I was on a work visa. I was scared and I didn't want to be fired. I didn't want to go back to India. So this situation at work affected my health care. A decision that should have been between me and my doctor was now effectively an imperative set by my manager. So at my next appointment, I told Dr. A that I had to go back to work. Now he urged me to give it another week of working from home. He was concerned that I wasn't progressing well. But the next day I started going to office dis despite the incredible pain. Ultimately, I stopped going to Dr. A because I knew that I hadn't followed his instructions and I was ashamed of that. So five weeks after after five weeks in the care of Dr. A, I went to my PCP, who put me on Celebrex, another anti-inflammatory, and a round of physical therapy. Now, pushing through the pain had become a default state of sorts, a point of no return, even at physical therapy. I figured the Celebrex was probably reducing the pain, so I didn't bring up pain management, and I don't think my PCP did either. But the truth is that I was still in a lot of pain. I also made really slow progress at physical therapy. I remember when I turned in my self-evaluation for a progress note and my physical therapist, let's call him therapist X, told me that if I didn't show enough progress, then insurance wouldn't pay for my treatments. Now I could understand his concern about insurance, but I felt like I was failing as a patient. And what was missing was this understanding of where I was starting out. 
And that's what equity is really, ensuring an equal outcome for a person in a system while accounting for where they started out when they were put into the system. I was starting out with a previous injury that I hadn't treated optimally. I was very deconditioned and months of just pushing through the pain. And of course, we didn't know that I had Ehlers-Dano syndrome, which was likely contributing to my very slow progress. So after a few months, I was tired of pushing, my, pushing through the pain, both at work, at PT, and in my daily life. I was also missing the support of my family and the support of a familiar place and a familiar system. I read about FMLA, and I finally took an unpaid medical leave of absence to go back to India. I decided to try traditional Indian medicine called Ayurveda, which promised to work wonders for some intractable conditions. It helped to some extent with the uh, it's helped to some extent with the pain, and more importantly, my time in India allowed me some rest and respite. But it also opened me up to an emotional scar that would take some time to heal. When I confided in my family about how much pain I was in, they didn't quite believe me. I had pushed myself for so long in bearing the pain and the dysfunction that I had created a facade of being fine. If you were in so much pain, how were you able to work and manage all by myself? My dad had questioned me. Now, there's a lot more I can unpack here, but I want to mention this as an example of how other people tend to perceive pain or any invisible illness, really. They perceive it through one's functioning, even if that functioning is causing pain. And this happened in a clinical setting as well. I saw a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor, I'll abbreviate this as PMR, in India, who was recommended to me by my friend. And this was the first time that I'd heard of that speciality, physical medicine and rehab, PMR. And it happened, it so happened that it was actually the right fit for me. Now, this doctor told me I had fib myofacial pain similar to fibromyalgia and put me on a stretching routine and gave me some uh, vitamin D and B12 supplements. But he also told me to ignore the pain when he saw that I was keeping a pain diary. And that was the curious paradox of pain. Even as I was bearing a lot of it to the extent that I was miserable, I was accused of dwelling on it because I was keeping a pain diary and because I was searching for answers. And I would see this in both healthcare systems here in the US as well as in India. Now, it so happens that people with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome have a pain response that is comparatively higher. So we were missing this piece of the puzzle. So after two and a half months in India, I came back to the US in January of 2011. I visited my PCP's office to get cleared to go back to work after my medical leave. Now, during my leave, my PCP had left the practice and was replaced by a new doctor. Let's call her Dr. B. I vaguely remember Dr. B asking if I needed any accommodations at work, which was nice. She wrote me a note for my workplace to get me a high back chair, which by the way, I found out that I would have to pay for. So I never ended up getting one. She also referred me to a physical medicine and rehab doctor. Now I wanted her opinion of my condition and she told me that she honestly wasn't sure, but she did tell me that if she was in pain, pain management would be really important. And if she were me, she would take pain medicine like candy. By the way, I don't think she was referring to our opioids. I just have to say that. <laughs> and when she said that, I realized that I was more invested in trying to find the cause of the pain rather than trying to manage the pain. Now, it was indeed this pursuit of answers that finally led to the diagnosis of EDS, which explained these symptoms. But I do wonder if at least during that first year, my pain would have been better managed if I had adopted this approach of symptom relief rather than searching for answers. And this is now a paradigm that I understand. I also appreciated that provider in the urgent care who told me that pain management was important after an accident, and I really wish I had internalized what he was telling me. Now, I recently noticed a sign in a clinic here in the Bay Area that advised patients that they had a right to seek pain management, and I wish I had been reminded of this back then. Pain is still a complaint that the patient generally has to bring up in most cases. It is also the patient's responsibility to judge how much pain they are okay with, which makes sense, except for patients who are so out of touch with their bodies like me, or have misguided notions about pain, or have mental health conditions, because they might not make that judgment call well. And this is something that I really want to underscore, because that's what happened to me. So now this new PCP, Dr. B, telling me about pain management nudged me towards trying some new pain medication. This new PMR doctor that I went to, let's, talk, let's call her Dr. C, prescribed gabapentin for three months as a trial. Now I felt extremely tired on this medication, but because my last attempt at a change in medication had backfired, I just stuck with the three months and I plodded on. Again, the pain didn't disappear, but I figured it was being reduced. 
It was hard to say because for me, my pain was tied to physical activity and functioning. I also did another round of physical therapy, and this time I met a therapist, let's call her Therapist Y, who helped me formulate my treatment goals. Now, this concept of a treatment goal was new to me, and it would become an important yardstick that I would use in the coming years. She understood where I was starting out, and she helped me come up with the goal of increasing my function through strength. She told me to be patient with myself, and I really appreciated that. Looking back during this treatment, what was missing was steps to manage my functioning at work because I was in more pain on weekdays. I didn't have that high back chair. There was no respite room where I could lie down for a bit. And it was also a little complicated to navigate a potential reduction in work hours because I was on an H-1B visa, which required me to work 40 hours a week. And the medical leave I had gone on was unpaid. Had this piece of puzzle been in place where I was a little more functionally supported at work, I think I would have progressed much better and I would have had better healthcare out in, outcomes. Excuse me. <clears throat> now, in the meanwhile, my boyfriend and I decided to get married at the end of the year. This was 2011. Relocating with my job wasn't possible. He was here in the Bay Area. So I decided to quit my job and move back to India for a few months and then come here to California. So because of this relocation, I told the doctor that I wanted to get off the gabapentin and I wanted to pause my physical therapy. In retrospect, I wish I had discussed transferring my care with my doctor instead of stopping my medications and my treatments. I made this decision of stopping also because I wanted to give Ayurveda another shot. With my experience so far, I realized that the outcome of a treatment depended a lot on the treating provider, and I was tempted to try Ayurveda again because of the promises it offered to completely eradicate me of this esoteric pain that had gripped me. Now, this also shows how obscure my understanding of the pain was at the time. The diagnosis of fibromyalgia left me with more questions than answers because I didn't have whole body pain, just pain in my neck and upper back, but I was hesitant to question my doctors on their diagnosis. Me going back to try Ayurveda was also a reflection of my situation as an immigrant, where I was traveling not only between two countries, but also two different healthcare systems. So I went back to India, this time for five months in 2011, and tried one more round of Ayurveda, which did not help, but actually hurt. In retrospect, the vigorous massage and pounding that they do in Ayurveda to my muscles and joints probably did not sit well with my ehlers danlos syndrome, but I didn't know this at the time. And what I didn't know ended up hurting me. This unraveled the gains that I had made at physical therapy earlier in the year. So this was an example of a healthcare decision that I took that ended up hurting me and effectively undoing the progress made by another practitioner. And what I didn't know would hurt me all over again. Because my EDS had not been diagnosed yet, I didn't know that chiropractic treatments would not suit me. Now, I moved here to the Bay Area in January of 2012 with my husband. He had had a good experience with chiropractic treatments, and he even thought to try them only because his company's wellness center had offered it. I should have found a physical therapist and stuck to physical therapy, but since his wellness center offered it and the doctor there told me that physical therapy and chiropractic treatments were similar, I decided to try it. This made me think about how ease of access can affect our healthcare decisions. In parallel, at this point in 2012, I was feeling guilty about not working, and I started working remotely as a contractor, and I could now set my hours without going through any paperwork because I was no longer in a visa, but I was in another type of authorization called an EAD. Now, a few months into my treatment, I had to switch chiropractors because my husband was moving to a different company and we wouldn't have access to his wellness center. I had realized my previous mistake with continuity of care. So I asked my chiropractor if he could transfer my care to someone else. But this time, the continuity of care backfired on me. One of the first things that this new chiropractor did, let's call him Dr. J, was to tell me about his accident and how he shouldn't be walking or even standing after his accident, but he was. Now, he probably wanted to inspire me, and I did feel a little inspired, but I also felt really ashamed of my body because I couldn't shake off this pain while Dr. J here was thriving. So while it's tempting to compare pain, and I used to do it all the time, it's tempting to compare bodies and compare progress. It's just not equitable to do so. My previous chiropractor, who had the most gentle bedside manner, had also told Dr. J not to do an adjustment on my neck. I don't know the reason why he said that, but he probably figured that I had hypermobile joints. 
But Dr. J told me, my goal is to adjust your neck. The minute your previous doctor advised you not advised me not to do it, I knew I had to. I felt like he was posing this as a challenge more than trying to help me. This should have been a red flag for me. He would ask every now and then at each session as if I was ready for an adjustment and would occasionally compare me to other patients who had gotten adjustments and were healing well. He seemed really, he seemed extremely sort of um, sure that a, an adjustment would, would help me. But, and he ultimately did three adjustments to my neck with my consent, of course, except that the consent came after a bit of gaslighting. Now, I wondered why I continued to see Dr. J and I questioned myself for a long time. I had been officially diagnosed with depression a few months before this, and I had also internalized a sense of helplessness because of the constant pain. There was also a bit of that cultural context of a medical provider being an authority figure. And because I had been gaslit a fair amount as a child, this was familiar to me and I tolerated it, even as a part of me thought this can't be right. I can say this for sure. Had I been in the mental and emotional state that I am in now, I would have parted ways immediately. And I want to highlight this. Sometimes patients can stay with a provider who's not the right fit or who's just not saying the right things and not protest or advocate for themselves because of their emotional and mental health. So I finally stopped seeing Dr. J when my neck started to pop and I realized that something was definitely wrong. So with my neck now propping and crackling, I did what sh I should have done in the first place. I found a PCP who is now outside the wellness center, let's call her doc Dr. H, and she ordered an MRI, which came back clear. She ordered a round of physical therapy for me, which I gladly went to. In the meanwhile, though, the pain in my neck had morphed into not only pain, but weird burning sensations. I was now working 40 hours a week because it was crux time in the project, and I realized I was back to the same situation that I was in 2000, into 2010, and I couldn't take the pain anymore. I was having suicidal ideation at this point, wondering how nice it would be to just not be alive and not have all this pain. My husband sensed that I was extremely stressed and worried about me and asked me if I wanted to quit. But I didn't want to quit a second time because I felt like I'd failed in trying to live my life as a normal person. It took a stomach bug to convince me. Let me explain. We're now in January of 2014. I was down with a cold and then started vomiting and the internist I saw was a middle-aged South Asian woman. Let's call her Dr. K. She diagnosed me with a stomach virus and then asked me about the chronic pain on my chart. You're too young to have chronic pain, she said. At first, I wanted to roll my eyes. I had heard this a lot in India. She seemed curious though and asked me how it started and I briefly explained. She then gave me some unsolicited advice, but it turned out to be the best advice someone could have given me at the time. She told me that if financially possible, I should take a break from work and take care of my health instead. She talked about how corporate America squeezed people dry. She said I should exercise my neck muscles every day till they were the strongest muscle in my body. She told me to take care of myself. And her advice resonated because it was the words I had wanted to hear from my parents for so long. Take care of yourself. In that way, I think her being a South Asian woman helped. She could have been my aunt or my cousin. And I wonder if she suspected that as a South Asian, I was more worried about doing what was expected of me rather than what I wanted to do. Now, she could have said the same thing to another South Asian woman with chronic pain, and her words may have come across as patronizing. So I understand that it's not just our shared identities, but our experiences and our histories that color our interactions, just like we've seen with all these other interactions. So I asked my PCP if I could go on a med medical leave, and she agreed, and I did not feel guilty this time. A quick note on mental health. I also had this misconception that my depression and anxiety would be cured if I just tried hard enough and if I maybe meditated hard enough. And this was definitely linked to my South Asian identity where mental health is still a taboo topic, generally speaking. And so even though my PCB suggested I take an SSRI, I asked her about other options. And so I went to cognitive behavioral ther therapy instead. I also asked to see a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor. I had to wait three months for that appointment. So in the meanwhile, I went to another clinic which was focused on spine-related issues. At this point, after the chiropractor debacle, I decided I was going to get second opinions on anything related to my neck. I also want to acknowledge the privilege I had in having health insurance that allowed for the second opinion. 
And it was at this visit that I met a doctor who acknowledged the pain that I was in. Let's call him Dr. S. He told me that the pain had become a vicious cycle and that unraveling it would take some time. He didn't dismiss or gaslight me, even though he had a reserved and rather stoic demeanor. He prescribed steroid injections to all facet joints in my neck, and he wanted me to take an SSRI. He also suggested I see a pain psychologist. He told me as he said this that he wasn't questioning my pain at all, just that what I had been through seemed traumatic and a pain psychologist would help me process it all. And I'm so grateful for him, not, not only for this advice, but for, for the way that he delivered this advice. At this point, though, I was just so traumatized from the chiropractor that the thought of invasive injections to my joints was just really scary. I now wanted an extremely conservative approach to treatment, and I wanted to try just one thing at a time. So I decided to visit the PMR doctor that my PCP had referred me to. And it was at this visit that I got an answer to the pain that I had hypermobility, which was possibly why I was still in so much pain even four years after the accident. However, this was the doctor, I'll call him Dr. R., who had that conversation with me about seeing lots of Indian patients with my condition. Now, Dr. R probably saw that I was anxious about my symptoms. So it was perhaps to alleviate some of my anxiety that he told me a few things. He said that gymnasts would love to, love to have hypermobile joints and I appreciated him saying that. On another visit though, he gave me another example. He spoke about how hypermobile folks rarely had broken bones because the joint absorbed the impact and gave me an example of a patient of his who had been hit by a car. He said that while she was in a lot of pain, she didn't have a single broken bone. And he said this like it was a good thing, but in my perspective, it was definitely not because the treatment of a broken bone is so precise and definitive and time bound, but not so much for the repeated sprains that come with EDS. So if I had to trade having EDS for having broken bones, I would in a heartbeat. He also didn't realize that mentioning an accident was a trigger for me. Although I really do empathize with medical staff who do not get trigger warnings and have to hear about so much more. There are some things he did that I'm really grateful for. He guided me towards whole body strengthening and not just upper back. He also got me through a second accident where I got rear-ended, and he convinced me to go on an SSRI for pain management. Now, I had hesitated to take an SSRI for the longest time, but he managed me to get me, he managed to get me on a low dose of nortriptyline, which is an, an SSRI or an antidepressant, by telling me that even kids with bedwetting problems, with bedwetting problems receive this drug. And that helped me because I decided to try the nortriptyline and then moved on to, an, to another SSRI, which has been instrumental in managing my pain, my depression, and my anxiety. In this case, this comparison of a child taking this medication actually helped and didn't feel dismissive, maybe because he didn't say something like, well, if a kid can take this without being scared of it, then so can you. But he simply told me that this was the context of how relatively harmless the medication was. So while it was still a comparison, the way that it was delivered made all the difference. But now not all comparisons were delivered that, that way. One time he was trying to describe how the pain had gotten pathologized in my case in my nervous system. He told me an incident where he had a pang of pain after a sushi making class and it was really bad, but he brushed it off and he wasn't scared by it. Now this was ironic because all I had done in the past few years was brush the pain off although I was very scared of it. Now I get that he was trying to tell me that I was processing the pain differently. But I wish he had said it in a way that acknowledged the trauma that I had been through. Now, this was again an example of comparing pain between provider and patient, which I've actually seen come up in more than one instance. And here's something that parenting has taught me. I can't have empathy for my preschoolers' emotions if I haven't taken care of my own. And analogously, I wonder if this was the same for providers. I wonder if Dr. R had his own pain and trauma and nowhere to release it while I was releasing mine in the exam room. So my two cents is for all medical staff to take care of themselves. The work that you do is so intense and it can be so incredibly draining. So please fill your cups. Now I had a, I wanted to talk about the communication of pain, but I am running behind. So I'm gonna skip this. And instead um, I'll continue on with my journey. Now, Dr. R also sent me to a rheumatologist to verify that there wasn't anything wrong with my joints. Now, it was the rheumatologist who officially diagnosed me with type 3 ehlers danlos syndrome, and he again acknowledged the pain I was in, and he said he was sorry for what I'd been through. 
And more importantly, he said he believed me and that my story completely made sense. And I can't tell you how relieved I was to finally have an answer and to not think it was all in my head and to not feel ashamed of my body and not feel ashamed for the amount of pain I was in. So from 2014 to 2018, I also saw a pain psychologist who I found through my own searching. She was South Asian and I felt that she would get a lot of the context that I spoke about and she did for the most part. She, we did some EMDR and trauma-based therapy. She was based in Palo Alto and I had to eventually stop seeing her because she almost doubled her rates and she was also out of network and didn't process insurance. So this was an inequity that I faced as a disabled woman living in the Bay Area who wasn't working. But the work with a pain psychologist helped me accept my pain. And more importantly, understanding this concept of disability and accessibility also helped me accept my pain and accept my body. Now, my family still thinks that disability is a bad word, but I believe that disability is a range and a spectrum rather than a binary. And disability can also be dynamic. Disability for me doesn't mean giving up on my body. It just means accepting my body and accepting that there are some things I'll have to do differently than others. It's possible to still identify as having a disability and still pursue wellness. I now accept that my neck will never be the same as it was when I was 23. I use a high back chair to help me work better. I pace myself in my physical activities. I give myself haircuts. I don't tell providers that I identify as disabled unless I feel they'll understand where I'm coming from and not judge me. Because disability is still this concept um, that's understood as just very binary. Now, in the past few years, I've been able to advocate for myself, such as when I experienced pelvic pain. I was able to communicate to doctors that while I had a mental health condition and an existing pain condition, it wasn't causing my symptoms. I also advocated for myself and for my body during my pregnancy and childbirth. And I could probably talk for another hour about the complexities of women's health, mental health, and birthing, birthing but I'll stop here. Um, by the way, the last time that I saw Dr. R was when I was pregnant in 2018. I didn't know how it came up in conversation, but I told him that my OB had sent me to a maternal fetal medicine specialist because of my EDS. And he questioned that decision. Um, so, and a maternal fetal medicine is someone, um, it's all, they're also called a high risk um, obstetrician. And Dr. R said something like, oh, I don't see why you need that specialist, you're fine. And I was just taken back by his response because here was a doctor who I felt had been dismissing my pain, but I gave him the benefit of the doubt. And I figured that he was just trying to ease my anxiety and maybe give me a different perspective. But for him to make this seemingly dismissive comment on something related to my uterus over which he had absolutely no jurisdiction was downright insensitive and paternalistic. I decided that he was biased against me in a way that I couldn't reconcile and I parted ways with him. Now, this has not been the health of uh, this has not been the end of my health journey. Over the past two years, I've had a series of concussions. But I now realize that as a patient, I am responsible for my health, and my doctor is a partner in my health care rather than an authority figure. And this has helped shift my tone of conversation from timid and anxious to a little more sure, relaxed, and confident. And even when I'm frustrated with my body, I try not to be ashamed of it. I don't downplay my symptoms and I don't dwell on it either. I communicate not only my symptoms, but my hopes for a treatment and any other information that might be relevant. And I try to communicate my story because it's in the story that one can fill in the gaps between what we see on a chart and what we perceive as social identities. So I invite you to lead with curiosity and empathy and listen to stories beyond what is apparent. Thank you all so much for tuning in and thank you all so much for your time. I wanted to thank you so much, Nidhi, for sharing your personal story and your experiences. It was extremely insightful. I personally learned so much um, and you drew so many connections in so many ways to the healthcare industry. Um, we will now move on to the question and answer portion of this webinar. I wanted to just quickly remind the participants that uh, you all may still ask questions at this time. Um, the first question we have for you, Nidhi, is how can healthcare professionals engage better with patients who may not be accustomed to advocating for themselves, particular, particularly due to cultural norms? That is such a good question. Um, I think, you know, and there's so many ways um, and this is where, you know, I, I really, I really think that the healthcare system, like 
there's definitely there's a, definitely a lot of responsibility on the healthcare system because you know you're at the intersection of you know so many things so i get that like it's it's a lot um i think my my suggestion is you know listen listen to the story because that's where you know you, you get this bits of information of oh this person maybe is in x amount of pain or has this issue but is not advocating for themselves so i think asking questions really and sometimes, um, you know, it's a sense you get when you meet a person of, okay, maybe I don't know whether this person is telling me their whole story. Is there something more to it? So asking questions. I, you know, I, I a, a neurologist that I went to, he started off by asking me, oh, um, you know, what do you do for a living? Who's in your family? Where do you live? You know, what's the situation? And I noticed that on Yelp, someone had called this out and said, well, this is, I mean, why does he need to know all this? But I thought that was actually such a relevant question because he was establishing this context. And these concussions that I had, it was my toddler who was like, you know, butting heads with me or throwing things at me. And he said, okay, so I get that, you know, you have this rambunctious toddler, you need to take care of him, you need to take care of um, yourself. So he kind of set that context so yeah, my 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 two cents is basically ask questions, and you know if someone's not telling you the whole story, yeah, ask questions, not just with symptoms, but also, you know, where they're coming from. That's super helpful. Thank you. Um, the next question is: As healthcare administrators and workers, we are responsible for scheduling, coordinating the care, and treating for our patients. What do you recommend we can do at any of these touch points to ease the stress on those with visible and non-visible disabilities? Hmm. Um, well, the first thing is I would say accessibility. Um, you know, is there like, do you have a, uh, I, I forget what it's called, but like a touch phone system where if someone is not able to use their voice, they can, you know, they can schedule an appointment you know, through the web instead, or use a, um, again, I'm sorry, I forget what it's called, but they can use an alternative method. So I think definitely having different, um, different ways for a person to schedule. And I also think, um, you know, knowing that not everyone would know to advocate for themselves. Um, so for me personally, I know that, you know, when I was in Houston, all those years ago, I once had a really bad UTI um, and I was calling my PCP's office and they told me that, oh, she doesn't have appointments for the next few weeks. And I didn't think to press and say, hey, it's urgent. I have a UTI. I need to see her. I actually just ended up going to another provider um, instead and not in the same clinic. So that's one more thing I want to um, point out is um, accessibility also means accessibility for anyone with you know, mental health issues or a different cultural context who may not know that they have to advocate for themselves. I would say, I mean, it's, it's so hard to judge, you know, it's so hard to judge is this person advocating. But I, again, I think just asking questions, asking clarifying questions, that always helps. Thank you. Um, and then we just had a few more questions come into the chat. Um, one individual said, thank you for sh sharing your story. What would you advise for better understanding and accommodation in the workplace setting so people with different needs or ways of inhabiting space can be welcomed and not stigmatized um, and othered? Uh, in, the, in the workplace setting? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think definitely having um, having a having an accommodations process, you know, where someone can can request an accommodation and not be um, sort of penalized for requesting that accommodation. And I think coming from this point of view of, um, you know, believing that person and not, you know, trying to sort of assign any kind of blame or shame. That's great, thank you. Um, another question is from an individual is, I believe I have EDS, but the doctors I've seen are not familiar with it and don't know how to diagnose it. One provider noted that I may have it in my chart, but I've been unable to get a diagnosis. What kind of doctor should I see for a formal diagnosis? So I guess, what would you recommend in that? Oh yeah, the doctor I saw was a rheumatologist. So I, I believe that right now rheumatologists are, um, they basically diagnose it. Um, but yeah, the, the doctor I saw was a rheumatologist. Thank you. Um, and then also what open-ended questions did providers ask you that 
uh, felt that you helped um, in eliciting your story? Mm. I think um, that's a good question. I think, you know, whenever, um, whenever says, someone says, how can I help you? I, I first, I used to get a little thrown back, like, oh my gosh, I don't know how you can help me, but just help me. But, but that has been a good question to ask. And also, um, one question though, when I've been asked, so why are you here today? What, or what brings you here today? That also, for some reason, I don't know why it kind of closes me off, but I think, um, when someone leads with, okay, so I see you're here because of X, Y, and Z, can you tell me more? So I think those words, can you tell me more, has been really powerful for me personally. Now, you know, I get that it's so, and I think that's what also just makes this so complicated because all of us come with, you know, just like we saw with my story, with so many of these, you know, contexts, maybe potential triggers, you know, upbringing, different styles of communication. Um, but I think for me personally, the, the, the most helpful question has been, tell me more. Um, and also you know, anything that kind of asks me, okay, what, what, what is my goal? Am I looking for pain reduction or am I searching for an answer? Um, I think that has been really helpful. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I don't see that we received any other questions at this time. So I was, I, I, for the interest of time though, I think we can wrap it up, but thank you again so, so much for being here, for sharing your story, for talking about a topic that is so important and much needed to be discussed and socialized. Um, and so again, thank you for your time and thank you to our thank participants you. for joining us today. Have yeah, a good thank day. you all so much. For, thank you for having me. And yeah, thank you guys for your time. Of course. Um, one last question, sorry, that just came in is where can I find the recording? We will have this recording uploaded to our YouTube channel called Healthcare uh, Advocates for Social Justice. Um, and we'll send it out uh, to the group afterwards. Thank you all very much.